Grüß Gott, Prayerlings. Welcome to Wednesday Matins. How is everybody today? It is Wednesday. It is April. I almost said August. It's not August. It's April. April 27, 2022. And we are in the very middle of the second week of Easter. Yay! So we are praying Easter Pentecost Matins now, which you can find in this book, Lutheran Book of Worship, on page 131. What else are we doing today? Psalm 64, I had to stop for a minute and think what we were doing. Psalm 64, um, we're going to hear more from 1 Peter, chapter 1. Our hymn today is 134 in this book. But, the version we're going to have and hear has seven verses our hymnal has five. So after the first verse, there's two more verses that you don't have. They're in the comments. This is another one of those great Reformation hymns. If you look down at the bottom here, the text for this hymn was written by Martin Luther. And this is, remember how we talked about big, long Reformation hymns because they're teaching theology and such? And this is teaching about the resurrection and how that came to be. So what we're going to do, since it's a big, long hymn, I mean, each verse is long, and there are seven of them, like we did the other day. We're going to sing four verses, and then the last three verses we will sing instead of the Benedictus. And the same people that sang for us yesterday, the Concordia people, are singing today. And it's from the same set of CDs, Hymns for All Saints for Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. So that's what we're doing today. Also, it's chilly. It's 39. I know I might be the only one that's happy about that because the birds aren't happy. They, weren't, they aren't singing this morning as nicely as they were singing yesterday. Also, I have the window closed, so maybe they are and I just can't hear them. I'm rambling, so I'm going to quit rambling and <laughs> try to uh, get centered here so that we can pray matins together. How about that? Well, here's today's cup because I do need coffee. It's the little fox one. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Little fox is awake on this side. Little fox is rejoicing on being glad on the other side where he's asleep. All right, I'll be right back. And we will pray together. We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Give glory to God our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship him. 
O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Psalm 64 Hear my voice, O God, when I complain. Protect my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked from the mob of evildoers. They sharpen their tongue like a sword and aim their bitter words like arrows, that they may shoot down the blameless from ambush. They shoot without warning and are not afraid. They hold fast to their evil course. They plan how they may hide their snares. They say, who will see us? Who will find out our crimes? We have thought out a perfect ploy. The human mind and heart are a mystery. But God will loose an arrow at them, and suddenly they will be wounded. He will make them trip over their tongues, and all who see them will shake their heads. Everyone will stand in awe and declare God's deeds. They will recognize his works. The righteous will rejoice in the Lord and put their trust in him, and all who are true of heart will glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you gave your son victory over those who plotted evil against him. When he cried to you in his agony, you delivered him from the fear of his enemies. May those who suffer with him in this life find refuge in you. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn, Christ Jesus Lay in Death's Strong Bands, verses 1 through 4.
continued. A reading from Second Peter, I mean First Peter, sorry, First Peter, chapter one. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you invoke as father him who judges each one impartially according to his deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest at the end of the times for your sake. Through him you have confidence in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, love one another earnestly from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord abides forever. That word is the good news which was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Again, there are, I said this yesterday, there are a couple of things in here I want to talk about. And then I only talked about one of them because I got carried away. Expect that today as well. But there are a couple of things I'd like to talk about. <clears throat> Maybe I'll do them in reverse order. Through Christ, you have confidence in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. And also, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. How do those two things go together? If you have confidence in God and your faith and your hope are in God, why should you conduct yourself in fear throughout the time of your exile? Of what should you be afraid? Well, I'm going to answer that two ways. The first way will be if that word actually means fear, then what you need to fear is you. Not God. You don't need to fear God. You don't need to be afraid of God, do you? You have confidence in God and your faith and your hope are in God. So you don't need to be afraid of God. A lot of people are because stupidly the church has taught people <coughs> to be afraid of God because they've taught people that God is sitting around at a giant computer in the sky waiting for us to make one tiny mistake so that we can be zapped with a lightning bolt or have some other ill fate befall us as punishment for our sin. 
we did that. We, the church, taught the world that. And then we wonder why nobody wants to be in the church anymore since we tell them that and then also tell them God loves them. God loves you so much that he can't wait to send you to hell for making mistakes. Okay, so <laughs> we don't need to fear God because God loves you so much that he has done everything possible to make sure that you and God are never separated for all eternity. That's how much God loves you. So if this fear here, that Peter just said, to conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of our exile, if that actually means be afraid, then we need to be afraid of ourselves, not of God, of ourselves. Afraid of our weakness and our propensity to follow things that aren't God. Our human nature, redeemed, but not yet perfect, still has an inclination toward things that aren't from God. We know that. We do that all the time. So we need to be afraid, since they're using, Peter is using the word fear, afraid of our falling into that, afraid of our not being vigilant and not paying attention and letting our minds and our souls wander away from God. Don't do that. And if you're confident in God and your hope and your faith are in God, then you will always seek God, who is always seeking you, by the way. God is continually seeking you. God doesn't want you to get lost either. The end of Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy, that would be God. What? Follow me? The word is pursue relentlessly. Track me down. Hunt me down. All the days of my life. However, that word fear might be not afraid, but reverence. Like when we talk about fear of the Lord, we mean reverence. So conduct yourselves with reverence throughout the time of your exile, which also makes sense in this context. If your confidence is in God, if all your faith and your hope are in God, then you will lead a more reverent life than people whose confidence and faith and hope are elsewhere. Because if your confidence is in God and your faith and your hope are in God, then you are blessed with the understanding that between you and Yahweh, which one is actually God? A lot of people are confused about that. And a lot of us, who should know better, act at times as if we forgot. Like we're God and we get to tell Yahweh what to do and how to behave and what God should be doing. And when to do it and how to do it. We all do that. Wait, is it only me? I don't think it's only me. We all do that. But if we are living out of reverence for God, we always know. God is God, not me. I can ask, I can tell God what I think, what my opinion might be, and how 
I would handle a situation. That's fine. But always knowing that that is most likely not the way things will happen. Because I don't know if you ever noticed this in your life, but God never does things the way a normal person would expect things to happen. I was going to say, is it never or only rarely? It's never. It's never. When's the last time you saw God do something expected? Or quote unquote normal? God doesn't work that way. The thing that I wanted to, I was going to start with, but knew that if I did that, we would be here for a hundred years, is this. As he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I'm going to try not to talk for a hundred years about this. I'll try to be succinct. People get nervous when they hear that. It comes up in our lessons on Sunday every once in a while. God does say that in Scripture. Be holy, for I am holy. Jesus tells us that. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Peter just said it. It must be important. But how are we supposed to be as holy as God? Is that even possible? Can we be as holy as God is holy? The answer is yes, but you have to rearrange your definition of holy. If your definition of holy is something way above human standards of conduct, someone who is always perfect in their conduct, never has an impure thought or a wrong thought, never acts in a way that is disrespectful to God or humanity or the rest of creation, never hurts anybody, never has any negative emotion. If that's your definition of holy, put it in a paper bag and throw it out the window. That will get you nowhere. If you're going to be holy like God and you think that's how God is holy, you will fail and you will despair. You cannot do that. But as far as I can tell from Scripture, holy, and Scripture calls us holy a lot, us being God's holy people, a holy nation. Holy means something that is, or someone, that is set apart by God for God's own purposes. That happened to you on the day of your baptism. You were set apart by God on the day of your baptism for God's purposes. To build up the church and to carry the good news of the gospel into the world. To love one another and care for each other. That's what holy means. To be single-minded about what God wants done. Because that's, that's what God does. Whatever God decides needs to be done, that's what happens. God's purpose is always fulfilled. God sees to that, that God's purpose is always fulfilled without fail. 
That's the holiness of God, if you ask me, which you didn't, but I told you anyway. So when God or Jesus, God's Son, Son of God, Jesus or Paul or Peter or anybody else calls us to be holy because God is holy, I'm pretty sure that's what they mean. Which is the same, I think, as living with reverence. Keeping our minds fixed on God's purpose. And watching ourselves so that what we desire is what God desires. And the way we live out of that is the way God would have us live out of that. And the way we treat other people and the way we care for creation and the way we love <clears throat> is the way God desires that we do that. To me, that's what being holy like God is. And you, as I said before, are God's holy people. That's what saint means. You're all saints. A saint is a holy person. A holy person is someone completely dedicated to the will of God. Set apart by God, in fact, for that very purpose. Okay, let's finish our hymn. If you have the hymnal, I think we're on verse 3 now. Let me look. Yes, we're on verse 3 now if you're reading from the hymnal. The end of our hymn.
us pray. <clears throat> All-powerful God, help us to proclaim the power of Jesus' resurrection. May we who accept this sign of love of Christ come to share the eternal life he reveals. For he lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> o Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Lord Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and direct our days and our deeds in his peace. Amen. <coughs> Thanks, Prayerling. Sorry for this frog in my throat. Jeez. Spring. I always blame it on spring, even when it's not spring. Blame the pollen. All right, dear ones, <clears throat> please enjoy your day today. Thank you for starting it with me, or at least sharing the beginning of it with me. Go out there and be holy, just like your Father in heaven is holy. I'll be back tomorrow, and we'll pray together again. Meanwhile, remember that I love you and that he loves you way, way more. Guten Tag.